with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Too Many Captains Productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Robert Ortegon. And this is Collateral Cinema. Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, joints, smoke it if you've got it. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm doing great. It's, it's good to be under one roof. It, it is, yeah. Again. Again, yeah. <laughs> right on. And as we are recording this, I guess the rest of the country is kind of on fire right now. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's a very terrible situation. I mean, I am shocked by it, but not really surprised given what we know about the situation. So, I mean, we definitely want to acknowledge what's going on in Minneapolis. I mean, the protests are still going on as we speak right now. And yeah, we, we definitely speak out against that sort of thing. We speak out against police brutality. I mean, the racial disparities are there. It's obvious, but I mean, as much as I would, as, as much as I hate getting political on this show, we should at least say something about it. So yeah, that's pretty much it right there. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and, and our hearts go out to the family of George Floyd. Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely, our hearts go out to them and to the to minorities, you know, across the nation. That, yeah, to to the black community and and, and everything, like definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, with that out of the way, we are getting into our first ever anime movie, right, guys? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm super stoked. I mean, I'm a huge anime fan. Um, you might say a, a weeaboo or otaku, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I've always been a, a big fan of anime and uh, so I'm glad that we're kind of tackling, uh, actually something that I hadn't seen before this. Uh, yes. And that movie is perfect blue. The, I believe it came out in 1997, 1997. Yes. And it's directed by the late great Satoshi Khan and his filmography is very interesting. I mean, he started out as, I guess, more of a writer at first, but eventually he started directing actual anime series and anime movies. And I believe the first one that he actually started off with was actually Jojo's Bizarre Adventure from back in 93. Hell yeah. That's all. That was actually interesting to find out he was involved in Jojo. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's become such a cultural touchstone for anime fans and otaku now. So. It's a it's a meme culture now. I mean, there's a, there's a memetic value to it. Oh, it's yeah, it's total meme shit. And Robert, is this the first anime movie that we've actually watched together? Together, yeah. And I'm just gonna pretend to know what you guys are talking about. So. Oh come on! Oh come on! <laughs> I don't know. Dude. I'm, I'm listening. I'm just listening. wait for Akira. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man, Akira, you're going to wonder what the fuck is going on in that shit. Like seriously. But apparently, you know, Perfect Blue is actually based on the novel Perfect Blue: Complete Metamorphosis by Yoshikazu Takeuchi. Yeah. 
there, there's a lot of anime and Japanese cinema that is based on literature, especially Japanese literature. You know, Audition is actually a prime example of that. And Satoshi Kon, he actually did some other interesting anime movies that are very similar in tone, although they're not all like psychological horror. They have similar thematic elements throughout all of them. And he has movies like Millennium Actress, which is about a camera crew that is basically like interviewing this actress about her career. And it goes into several interesting places. Like it's constantly like flowing through all the movies that she's been in. And it has that kind of breaking the fourth wall characteristic to it. Not unlike Perfect Blue. So, I mean, that's a very interesting movie. I won't spoil too much about this or these other movies in his filmography. And he also did Tokyo Godfathers, which is actually a Christmas movie, believe it or not. Oh, damn. And it's about three homeless people, a runaway, an alcoholic, and a trans person who find this baby on Christmas Eve, and they go on this trek throughout the city to find out where she came from and who her parents are and everything. And it leads to a very heartwarming ending. And one of my favorite anime series of all time, probably one of the greatest anime series of all time, was made by Satoshi Kon. He made Paranoia Agent, which is about this girl who's actually a character designer at an anime studio who creates this really, really cutesy kawaii mascot. And this mascot starts to manifest itself in real life and everything. And then eventually, because she's really, really depressed and she's just kind of trying to find answers to her life, this boy with a bat on rollerblades, he's called Shonen Bat, comes in and whacks her on the head, and it just starts this really, really crazy chain of events that almost envelops all of Tokyo, Japan. It is yeah. out there. It is an Adult Swim classic. I would love for them on Toonami to actually reshow this series, but I love that show so much. Like, Just the intro theme itself is memorable. It's literally a bunch of the characters standing in front of weird backdrops laughing while this very weird Japanese song is playing. It's, <laughs> it's really fucking cool, man. And also Paprika, that's one of his more well-known movies, probably outside of Perfect Blue. Yeah. That movie is very much like Inception, kind of. It's about a woman who can actually jump into people's dreams and mm. whatnot. Dream yeah. Warriors. Yeah, yeah, it's Dream Warrior shit, pretty much. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's just a brief overview of his filmography, and his directorial style is extremely visual, very fourth wall breaking at times, and it also kind of delves into more psychological elements. Mm -hmm. More or less, like especially with Paprika and Perfect Blue, there's very dreamlike qualities to these movies and Millennium Actress as well. And I mean, he, his thematic elements are typically kind of consistent throughout his work. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're explored in different ways and we'll, we'll go into how they're explored in Perfect Blue after a little while. But I mean, he uses the male gaze. Yeah. It, which is, as a concept, it states that the camera is kind of, since it's coming from, you know, male crew members and a male director and a male writer, typically, it's going to frame women in a specific way, namely in a very sexualized manner. Yeah, I definitely see that. And you're talking about, like, on the meta level, like how this yes, movie is very meta. So then it's almost self-parody? Not self-parody, probably self just more self-awareness, yeah. That's interesting. I, I hadn't, you know, really thought about it that way. I know, you know, when you say the male gaze, I, that's also, you know, portrayed in the film with the, the faceless crowd. Yeah. And we're going to get into that other thematic element, which is also consistent throughout his work, but especially prevalent in Perfect Blue, which is the, the nature of performance and the agency of performers versus how audiences actually consume their image more or less, or consume the identity that is built for them, the, the commodified identity. Also, social stigmas and how they affect people on an individual and a social level 
are also really, really prevalent throughout his work. And it's very obvious in this movie where that's coming from, but especially in Paranoia Agent. Like, it's very, very heavy on that specific theme. And this movie, and we're going to go ahead and link the video that helped us kind of construct uh, what our discussion here. Yeah, that video definitely helped. In it fact, was, it was by Ragnar Rocks. Yeah. Yeah, so, so shout out to him. We'll, we'll put a link to his video in the show notes. But because, you know, when I first watched the movie, I wasn't quite sure how to uh, deconstruct that. You know what I mean? Or how to digest it in any way. Right, right. Um, you know, it's kind of like when we watched The Shining. I mean, I really feel like I need another view through before I fully understand it. Honestly, you need several view throughs to really get what's going on here. Yeah. But it kind of ties into where Japan was economically and socially in the early to mid 90s, at least starting at the late 80s. And due to deregulation of their economy, which allowed a certain type of inflation to kind of, you know, inflate the value of the Japanese yen, markets were really, really flush with yen at that time, both worldwide and in the Nikkei. The oh, Nikkei yeah. was at its highest level at that time. But at the advent of the 90s, around 1990, that bubble just burst. Well, it's interesting, too, because I remember specifically, um, or at least I've seen that image of Japan as this technological utopia. You know, it sees the progression of technology in a positive way in a lot of cases. And Japan is seen in a lot of future movies as at the forefront of technology. And they really believed that at the time. They, they really did. They, they thought that Japan's economic model and their social model was something that was exemplary and something to be also modeled after in other places. But, of course, like any other economic bubble, that did not last, you know, especially in a deregulated economy. And yeah. that bubble burst, you know, and, and like you said, there was a lot of technological advancement during that time before the 90s. And after... That bubble burst, they pretty much consider the 90s to be a lost decade. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting just to see the, the disconnect now, you know, with the, the progression of the Internet. I mean, this is the Internet in its early stages, as we see in the movie. And looking at the Internet now, and, and honestly, this movie seems kind of ahead of its time. It's extremely ahead of its time, and that's because Japan was ahead of its time when it came to Internet culture. Right. They, they were kind of the first ones that actually kind of substantiated the whole chat group culture. Like, you know, I think Chan culture also kind of started there back in the day. Yeah. And you look at you watch this movie and you when you finally do, you know, kind of deconstruct it. You feel this pervading sense uh, of doom, you know, with how far Internet culture has infiltrated our lives and how, you know, like in the video that we watched, you know, explain that everyone is an otaku now. And, you know, so that gives this film more of a subtle horror quality that permeates throughout. It's almost like an existential horror in a way, right? Right, because of how it leaves you feeling after the end. It brings that horror into real life. <laughs> and yeah, and, and that's because otaku culture, it's very much tied to that economic bubble that preceded the 90s. You know, like, I mean, Japan was also at the forefront of pop culture at that time. And part of that was the rise of Japanese pop idols. Yeah. And we still see that in anime. We see the personification of, uh, of innocence, you know, and we see these girls that are honestly, what's the word? Inf infantilized? Infanticized? They're very infantilized. They're, they're treated like little girls. Right, Robert? Damn it. Nickelodeon. <laughs> Disney Nickelodeon, Channel. yeah, that that's actually a great point. It's kind of similar to that, right? Disney Channel, yep. Yeah, because we see some of that in the states also. You know, with the image of Miley Cyrus, you know, being yep. the the Disney star, and, and and several others like her, and then they go through their their rebel phase, and they go through their sense of exploring, pushing it to its limits. Britney Spears. So that they're, they're literally a sex object. Yeah, Britney Spears. Yeah, Christina Aguilera as yeah. well. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. then and then coming back, reborn and fully matured. <laughs> yeah, and Japanese idol culture is no different. Yeah. And this movie really goes into that. It goes into that dark underbelly of, 
you know, trying to live up to this idealized version of yourself, this identity that's foisted upon you versus, you know, who you really are and who you are as a person. Like it, it pretty much affects every aspect of your life. It's pretty much an image that you got to live up to. Exactly. Yeah. And women are, are forced into that, into that perfect balance between being the innocent woman or the woman that's untarnished, the virgin, but at the same time, highly sexualized. Yep, that is the virgin horror paradox. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's it's so strange. And in Japan, it's almost like this idea on steroids. It's very ingrained in their culture. Yeah. And I mean, that comes out in both kawaii culture and also in uh, the advent of the moe type of character. Yes. You know, moe moe, which is very, very cute, saccharine, kind of makes you want to be protective of them. It also leads to some horrible stuff like, you know, the whole lolicon shit. And But less said about that shit, the better. Why is it that the Japanese are so extreme in their culture? It's almost like a juxtaposition because Japanese people in real life tend to be more, I want to say, stoic. Yeah, maybe even reserved in many ways. Or Japanese culture encourages people to be that way in yeah. public, but and yet it's like they explore their fantasies and and it's it's always so like it's always so meta. <laughs> Deeply meta. I mean, and it especially translates into the pop culture that they import or export out to everybody else right we in the states like we get a you know a, a whiff of that culture and we become engrossed in it yeah and, and it, it becomes our our fascination our obsessions albeit it's a very specific flavor of otaku-ness like i i would say in america that's where you actually find the weeaboos well like in america otaku has has taken on that meaning specifically of you know uh fanatic of anime manga culture yeah i mean and that's traditionally what's kind of what people kind of see in their mind's eye when they think of these type of otaku or nerds as it were yeah it's it's crazier i, I would say geeks that's that's the equivalent it, it, it's geeky stuff yeah you're right you know just obsessive interests um and they even show that stereotype or you know archetype of a character with mr mimania mimania yeah yeah mr mimania that is Quite possibly one of the most frightening characters in the entire movie. Probably in all of anime. Oh, that motherfucker's so ugly. Got the House of Wax face. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's almost kind of like a... I don't know if it's like a rapey face. It's just more of an ugly it's distortion like, of humanity. It's that Goonies face. <laughs> what is it up with anime and doing that? They always show like these like pervy old men that are drawn like that. It, it It's another thing that I think is very much ingrained in their culture. You know, it's like it's it, very self-aware. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, try to white splain their culture or anything. I mean, <laughs> it, it it is what it is in many ways. But, I mean, yeah, you know. No, I'm just fascinated by it. As, as am I. I mean, I've been a longtime consumer of Japanese pop culture. I mean, I've never gone full weeaboo. I mean, I have a big stack of anime, but I don't necessarily have, like, anime posters all over the place. I don't have, like, the little... You don't have a waifu? I don't... I know. I don't have a waifu. I mean, I have favorite characters, but no waifus, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I find that whole thing to be a little disturbing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it's very disturbing to me. Oh, yeah, don't even get me started on the fucking bronies, because that's an extension oh, of this. Oh, yeah, clop, clop. That's all I have to say to that. <sighs> oh, God. And then there's the furry culture. <laughs> I actually don't have a whole lot of problems with furries. I have a lot of problems with furries. I mean, I, 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 I kind of get it. It's not my thing, but I get it. If you're a fur and you're listening to this, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> That's don't, fucking weird. Don't listen to him. We're not kink, <laughs> we're not kink shaming on this show. Come on now. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Well, it's it's. I mean, I, I'm I'm looking at Robert's judgmental face over there. I can just see it in his eyes. <laughs> what what do you have to say about that? Furries? Huh? Bunny costumes? <laughs> oh, all kinds of costumes. Are yeah. you kidding me? Bunny costumes. And they all watch B stars. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, furry community. Don't at me. 
No, no, don't don't add us uh, <laughs> for anything that's said here. I'm just playing a character. Yeah, yeah. Disregard everything. But let's go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes of this movie, the actual plot. We, I mean, it starts off with quite possibly one of the most brilliant intros in all of anime and probably all of cinema, and that's the... First off, it starts off with the Power Trons, which are pretty much Power Rangers. Yeah, the fucking... Oh, damn. Power Rangers? <laughs> that shit was awesome. And then we have the girl group Cham, and they're very typical of these types of idol groups. Very yeah. typical. And we're pretty much introduced to so much just in this first... Like, I want to say, like, not even five minutes of the movie. I mean, first we're introduced to Cham and we're introduced to Mima's pop idol character, more or less, or that image of her. We we see that version of her, the the, the Mima that's on screen, the Mima that the that the, 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 the Mima the Mima that the audience is seeing. Right. And you know what's interesting is throughout this film, we we still observe it that way. Um, I mean, Mima becomes an unreliable narrator. Well, not even being a narrator, but just everything being told from, you know, being shown from her point of view to which we, the audience, don't actually know what's reality and what's fiction. That's what's crazy. I mean, at least I, I couldn't keep up with it. I was trying to figure out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. That's why I say this needs another watch through just just with the context so I can pick up on all the cues. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> Visual I, and I otherwise. Mean, I, I don't blame you there. But we're also introduced to the glare of the audience, and that's where the whole male gaze theme comes in. Yeah. And the audience is seen as mostly faceless. They don't really have a singular identity. There's some people that stand out, you know? Like, yeah. like we have the three main otaku that are talking about Mima in the beginning and talking about Cham. And they're very much seen as just kind of, I want to say, like the normies of otakudom. If there is okay. such a thing. Yeah. And then, you know, there have the guys that just are there to like crash shit. Yeah. They, yeah. They're just the delinquents that are just trying to pull some bullshit and just trying to shit all over Cham. And, and then everything. you have Mr. Mimania. Oh, man. And he is very much shown as being monstrous. Just right off the bat, you know, just the image of him holding her the pop idol version of her in his palm. And, and if you noticed in that particular scene, how very narrow his view is of Mima, everything else is kind of, you know, faded out around the uh, circle in his hand. But once those delinquents start throwing those cans and everything, that's when that image is broken. Yeah. And then, you know, when she announces, you know, her, uh, her retirement, retirement from, from yeah, the music industry and being a pop idol. Yeah. It's pretty devastating to everybody, but you can also tell it's devastating to Mr. Mimania. Yeah. Because that's been his one like sole obsession. That's been his life and it's now come to an end. And, and so, I mean, that's, it, it's definitely, I think realistic of the extremes to which we go in our minds. I mean, it is a caricature of the situation, uh, in in most ways but then again there's probably someone out there who is exactly like you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah i thought it was like groundhog's day like right when we get to her apartment it just keeps getting dirty like more shit just keeps adding up every time she wakes up doing a scene right oh that's interesting observation yeah yeah that's that's really awesome i mean mima's room is not only like kind of like literally there but also figuratively there because we're also introduced to the website, the blog that's called Mima's Room. Yeah, that was really just trippy to me. <laughs> this whole yeah. website that's like told from her point of view, but is created by fans. Yeah, but I mean, early on during that intro, we're also shown images of Mima going about her daily life and everything and just, you know, picking up milk and food for her fish and everything. And all that eventually is listed on this blog that she comes across on, on Mima's room. And it becomes it becomes apparent that somebody is definitely watching her. Yeah, she's got a stalker, which, as it turns out, makes a lot of sense. You know, when 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 we realize that it's her uh, her manager, Rumi. Yeah, that's later on in the 
narrative, but at the very end, that's the at, plot twist. At, at the very, at the very least, we're kind of led to believe that it's Mimania that's following her. Yeah, there's definitely that red airing of Mimani. I mean, that's automatically who your mind goes to because go. he's creepy, he's stalkerish, he's an ugly motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. He's that, you know, perfect stereotype of the pervy otaku. <laughs> <laughs> but Mima is eventually convinced to start an acting career by her manager, Mr. Takakura, and Rumi is very much against it. She wants Mima to remain a pop idol, like, desperately. Yeah, and that's interesting considering her role in all this, so... I mean, the fact that early, even you know, early on, and, and I, you know, I noticed what you noticed, which was that you, she had these two people that were fighting over her, and she had really no say in this. So the whole time, we don't know genuinely how Mima feels about this change in her life. Does she want to remain a pop idol, or is she genuinely interested in, in moving on and breaking out of that mold? Yeah, or at the very least, we start to see the toll that it, it's taking on her later on in the narrative yeah it is taking a toll but i think ultimately because i was back and forth on this you know because i think you had mentioned something like well that's her like holding on to her her past life and i kind of see it differently i see it as i think she wants to move on but then when she's hit by trauma she almost feels guilted by society and that's why she sees the idealized version of herself as the the pop idol Mima. Not that she, that's what she wants to be, but that she that's what she believes is supposed to be. Now, see, the way that I see it is that it's more of a symbol of not only the delusion that she is sharing with Rumi and with Mr. Mimania. That's true. That's true. But it's it's also indicative of the commodification of idol culture. I mean, what that is is not just an image of her identity as a pop idol it's also her brand as a pop idol right the the her that she was marketed to be the her in the minds of her fans and of her manager and i mean if you know anything about japanese idol culture you know that that image is carefully crafted right she's just playing a character like quite literally you know yeah japan takes that to another extreme that we don't see a lot exactly and the TV show that she gets a role for, it actually becomes very integral to the narrative from this point on because it starts to really blend in with her real life and she starts to really lose track of whether she's actually Mima or if she's this Mrs. Takakura in, in the show Double Bind. Yeah, they almost pull one on you where you start to wonder what's real and what's fiction. And the whole time, I mean, you you realize, well, we're following the story of Mima, but you, you, on, you honestly start to question for a moment, you know, have we been led astray this whole time? Is, is, is the, you know, the other role that she thinks is the movie role, is that real? Is this movie going in that direction? It honestly throws you for a loop where while Mima can't figure out what the hell is going on and, and the difference between reality and fiction, neither can the audience. Just like Fight Club. It's very much like Fight Club. Fight Club. And, um, and interestingly enough, this movie also influenced Darren Aronofsky with some of his work, especially Black Swan. Mm. And I've heard that this has a lot of parallels with Black Swan, actually. It's, it's an extreme parallel, honestly. I mean, I, I don't even think that it's, you know, really that well hidden. But also what I like about Double Bind is that in a way it's kind of mirroring what Mima is actually experiencing in real life, sort of, especially with the loss of her identity and the trauma that she feels because of the rape scene, which is playing right now, by the way, behind us. And this is a very, very disturbing scene. Yeah, and you know, honestly, you, the audience, are starting to wonder if an actual rape is going on. Yeah, oh. but you're always being pulled out of it. You're being pulled out, and, and you know, you you realize again, okay, this is just a scene that she's doing. But honestly, like, for a little bit, I that was the takeaway for me, was that, you know, one of the actors got carried away, and they just let it happen. But that's actually not what's going on, but it's Mima deluding herself into thinking that. Yeah, I, but... The way that I see it, I mean, the trauma is the same one way or the other. I mean, well, 100%. She, she's very much like figuratively raped here. 
and yeah it it has such a deleterious effect on her like especially when she gets home and she has a breakdown like an ugly breakdown i mean it, it's like you actually your heart breaks for her a little bit it does because there is this hypersexualization of her you know seen in the film but it's not necessarily played for gratuity it's played for a meta perspective of that <laughs> yeah exactly you know it's just the reality of it hey collateral cinema listeners chazzle dazzle here from the trial by air variety show podcast just taking a few seconds to invite you guys over to what we do much like collateral cinema we are a grassroots podcast we invite bands from all over the world to come in and we dig deep into their souls and find really cool stories to tell you and there's tons of music every week so subscribe to us wherever you subscribe to your podcast we look forward to having you yeah and, and of course this rape scene comes after she has her debut scene and somebody gives her a letter which turns out to be a letter bomb that's the first indication that something is wrong that you know, things are about to get really, really fucking violent. Now, Robert, what did you think when you saw that scene first time, the the rape scene, and how it was actually framed and everything? Oh, man, I thought it was very real. Uh, I, I mean, I know, especially since it's animated, I think that in a way that adds to the realism in actually, some way. Actually, yeah, like Ash said, I thought they were just getting carried away with, like, one of the actors just took it too far, really. But, I mean, at one point during one of the cuts... Then they had like, to re- yeah, reset again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the actor straight up apologizes like, to her. I'm sorry. Like, I'm yeah. so sorry about this. And, and she's like, it's okay. I can, And, you know, I have a lot of movies, and we've consumed a lot of cinema where rape is used as a device. And in many ways, I would imagine that that is exactly how you film a scene like that. I mean, you really have to take real care and you have to approach it in a very sensitive manner. I mean, sex scenes in movies in general, you have to really approach it a certain way. Oh, yeah. I mean, as we talked about, I don't know if you you guys listen, but on, on Collateral Gaming, we just did our episode on Tomb Raider, the 2013 reboot. Yeah. There was actually a, a scene that was highly controversial or a supposed, there was going to be a supposedly a rape plot in there, but this never came to light and... What we actually got in the scene is what looks like a man who's about to sexually assault Lara, but if you fail the quick time event, he just kills her. But in any case, that scene still was controversial, and it's odd because it's, it's video games haven't reached that level yet where you can be realistic about something like that. Oh, there was a game that was released in Japan and on Steam that was pretty controversial. It was called Rape Lake. Rape. It was literally hell? a rape simulator. Thankfully, they took it off the, a the rape steam simulator. What a literal hell? rape simulator. I, I mean, I, I hate to even bring it up. I, mm. I don't even want to give it that much credit or attention. But yeah, that happened. Well, what about you know, like Custer's Revenge? Oh, God, Custer's Revenge. I mean, that was a thing. Yeah, that was definitely a thing. Oh, my God. I, I, you know, I was thinking about doing a bad game review, and then I was like, I don't know. I don't think I, I should give that game attention. <laughs> you probably shouldn't. You know? But. I mean, Kanye did a video that used the little graphic a little bit without any context whatsoever, which was kind of gross. What? That yeah, is I rem- gross. I remember this video. Kanye West? Yeah, Kanye oh. did it. Oh. Shit. But... Back to Perfect Blue, like we said, she has a very serious breakdown, and this is where her loss of self and her loss of identity and agency really starts to come into play. Yeah. Like, for instance, whenever whenever we see her during all the resets, like her apartment starts to get even messier, and it starts to look different, and that kind of conveys that... You know, she's going through this over a very long period of time. Well, she's going through a metamorphosis as the, you know, the book subtitle. It makes, yeah. It makes you wonder if she was just like dreaming, you know? Well, she, she right, yeah, when, right she, when she was waking up, you know, oh, it seemed like happy death day for a second. I don't know. It, yeah. It kind of had almost like Groundhog yeah. Day, happy death oh. day feel to it. Right. Yeah. No, that is crazy. You're right. This movie really just explores a lot of interesting themes. Yeah. We'll get at, into that here in a little bit, but you know, the, as the movie goes along, Mima is deep into production with Double Bind, and it starts to kind of parallel 
what she's going through and everything. And that's when the murders start happening. I, I think the first victim is the screenwriter of Double Bind that actually wrote the rape scene. That was the first victim. And he gets ice picked to death. Yep, he does. And the next victim, let's see, I think that it's the the photographer that takes nude photos of her. Oh, yeah, he was next. Yeah, yeah. That, that's actually the next escalation of her sexualization as an actress and as a woman was the photo session where, like, at first it's it's just kind of, you know, a little vanilla, but then it starts getting very sexual and eventually she's taking nude photos. Well, that's where the actual objectification starts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because the rape scene was just, I mean, that was played not as far, not, I don't think that was played for, um, titillation, titillation necessarily, yeah. but it just was. And she felt violated personally. But then after that, I think she just kind of gives herself over to whatever they, you know, demand of her. Because she feels like a victim. Hollywood, right? Yeah, very much Hollywood. I mean, that, Hollywood. that's that is how actresses in Hollywood have been treated up to this point. Child stars, yeah. yep. Child stars as well. And also, who else is murdered? Hmm. Who else is murdered? I, I don't remember. Th there was another person close to the production of Double Bind that was killed, I believe. I don't remember who it was. But anyway, so sooner or later, they wrap up the filming of Double Bind and Mima has pretty much lost herself by that point. Yeah. Like, I mean, Rumi has been doing her best to try to comfort her throughout this whole time, even coming over to her house and her apartment and everything and just trying to, you know, be a friend, I guess. But eventually she meets up with Mr. Mimania, who we see many times throughout the movie sitting by himself and, just kind of in his own little world, he's getting emails from who he thinks is Mima, the the idol version of Mima. Right, and and it's the her that's carrying on that persona. And eventually he actually sees the delusional version of Mima as a pop idol, who who actually becomes like a doppelganger, who is constantly taunting Mima and is pretty much driving Mr. Mimania to do what he's doing. Yeah, so if Mr. Mimania is experiencing that delusion as well, it reinforces the the shared psychosis. Yeah, and, and and ultimately it starts to manifest itself, like especially with Rumi, who eventually near the end of the movie, after Mima has already been attacked by Mr. Mimania, right, and uh, Mr. Mimania has been pretty much dispatched, Rumi takes Mima to what Mima initially thinks is her apartment, but it became, it becomes very apparent that no, that's Rumi's apartment. And it's made to look up like Mima's original room before she became an actress with, with her cham poster up and everything. Yeah. That's just a whole nother level of crazy. And then we see Rumi come out dressed like pop idol Mima. And what's interesting is that she often actually transforms into Mima. So Mima is is sharing the delusion that Rumi is her. Yeah. You know, she literally sees it that way because Rumi sees it that way. Yeah. And also Mr. Mimania. Yeah. Mr. Mimania sees that version of Mima whenever Rumi is, and Rumi is the one that's sending the emails to Mr. Mimania. He's the one who's seeing that whenever he's planning what he's doing. And we see it as an audience earlier in the film, and it's not really clear what's going on. We just see Mima killing somebody with an ice pick, which is insane to us because we're like, does she just start killing? Like, what's going on until we learn that that was the delusion, old Mima? That was Rumi. Yeah. And it's just crazy yeah. how that's early on, earlier on. Yeah. Until the, the plot twists where it's fully revealed. Yeah. And, and Rumi ends up killing both Mimania and Mr. Takakura. Right. And what ensues is, I think, one of the better chase scenes I've seen in cinema. Like, Rumi pretty much starts chasing after Mima, like, down a street. Like, Mima climbs out from uh, Rumi's apartment window. And it turns into this really, really bloody kind of nightmare, which, you know, there's reflections all around them. Like, that, that's a whole other theme throughout the movie that we'll get into here in a little bit. But yeah, eventually Rumi corners Mima. 
There's a window, and she's trying to use an umbrella to kill Mima, and she shatters the window, which is kind of representative of the delusion being shattered for both of them. Yeah. And Rumi tries to grab the the wig that she's wearing after Mima rips it off of her, and she ends up stabbing herself accidentally with a shard of glass that's sticking up from the frame. And then that's this is the best part, the ending. It's when Rumi goes out into the street. The truck is coming at her. And she embraces it. Like she, she, she embraces there, it, yeah. Like, l- like she's a character and like this is her on stage. Exactly. Yeah, uh, like she's under the spotlight and everything. But Mima eventually runs up, pushes her out of the way, and they're both safe. Yeah. And then Rumi, sometime later, Rumi is shown as being in a mental institute and Mima ends up coming to to visit her. And, and Mima comes to terms with herself because she metaphorically and literally saves herself. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's pretty much self-actualized by that point. Right. And, and the very last frame we see is her whipping up her glasses in a drive, in a rearview mirror, and saying, no, I'm the real Mima. Right. It's so interesting that, you know, at the moment that she saves the version of Mima that's still stuck as a as a pop idol. So it's like her saving that portion of herself, even whether regardless of, you know, what she decides to do. And if she moves on as an actress, she's rescued that version of her psyche, which I think allows her to finally move on. Yeah. And the way that Satoshi Kon directed this movie perfectly lays out all of the themes in a way that you know in many ways it's barely even subtext it's almost like full on text and some of the themes that he used was his u- use of color like especially the color red you see mima constantly surrounded by red in so many scenes especially in her apartment when she's actually like looking up the mima's room blog right like, yeah, she's juxtaposed with the red curtain on her doorway. I remember you pointing that out and, and noticing how often she is framed in red. Yeah, there's that scene when she's filming Double Bind where she's in a red bathroom and then... Oh, uh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, th- this scene right here, I think this is, this is a little while after the actual simulated rape scene. And... Yeah, she pretty much shows up and taunts her in this room, and it kind of foreshadows the danger and the further delusion that she is about to fall into. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's, this movie's insane. Like, every time I watch it, I notice something new about just a particular instance. <laughs> and also, Red is used to foreshadow what is a pivotal scene when she has her first breakdown, the death of her fish. Like there's a red shawl above her computer and everything. And it has little fish imprints on it, but the fish aren't really dead. She later looks and they're alive, right? Yeah. But it still alludes to that. Yeah. The, the, the movie just kind of breaks down as Mima breaks down, you know, and, and we, the audience aren't sure of what's real or not anymore. You know, as I said earlier, but so yeah. Hannah Montana is Molly Cyrus. <laughs> I guess so, dude. <laughs> well, think about it. I mean, that's probably something that Miley Cyrus also had to deal with. And that's that scene whenever she breaks out of that and when she went through her wrecking ball phase. Uh, yeah. 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 Which caused a lot of controversy. But for her, I think that was an important step of m- in moving on. And once she goes through that metamorphosis. Exactly, you know, and comes, you're not, you're not going to be a pop star forever, dude. So right, and you got, you got uh, yeah, the acting course. career thrown right in front of you. Just go with it. Right? And right. so you see this this cocoon that women, I think, in, in the entertainment industry, are forced to develop in order to become, you and, know, fully actualized. Well, that's also one of the themes that this movie touches upon is the female agency in the face of a commodified consumer culture. Yeah, I mean. It's like we alluded to bef- before. There's that scene where where Mima is in the meeting room with Takakura and Rumi. They're both pretty much kind of arguing over the path that her career is about to take. And she's literally just sitting in the middle. She's very quiet. She has no input. She's almost childlike in how she's taking the whole situation. 
And behind her, you see the reflections of Takakura and Rumi, and they're still like right over her shoulder. And, and that leads right into another theme that is constantly shown throughout this movie, which is reflections in mirrors yes. and how that represents the underlying you know, psyche. There's the subconscious parts the, the of, sub of Yeah, the subconscious psyche. Of their personalities. And, and that's really interesting the way that that's played uh, with that, that visual cue. You know, when we see the reflection doing something different, then... Yeah, and the interesting thing is, is that that type of reflection is shown in different ways. It's shown by the glass on buildings. It's shown by way of Mima coming up on television screens. Like, television screens are constantly used as a form of reflection in this movie. And, you know, this film was originally conceived as live action, apparently. At least that's what IMDb says. So it kind of just makes me more relieved that it, it is in an anime format because I just don't know if it, all of these visual you know, cinematography would have worked in the live action context. Oh, no, there, there's no way, especially at the time. Right, Robert? Oh, yeah. It, it thrives as an anime. And I think that that's what allows for this uh, hyper realism, but at the same time, symbolic qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it seems hard to reconcile, but. And, and mirrors are typically in film and in fiction used to symbolize either loss of identity or duality of identity. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, and those themes kind of cuts both ways throughout this movie, especially, especially in that scene in the train, whenever Mima's just looking at her reflection in the glass. And it's also shown in that scene where Mima is in the train She's looking at the reflection of herself in the glass and she's looking at the city go by and then eventually Pop Idol Mima comes out and th this is before the rape scene happens. It says, I don't want to do this. I refuse. Yeah, I noticed that too. And, and this is really just, you know, as the film is going through, I think still an exposition phase. And, and so you're really kind of trying to figure out what's going on and you know, where this internal conflict is coming from. Exactly. Exactly. And the shared psychosis that Mimania and Rumi and Mima show in this movie, I'm pretty sure that it's a theme that Cone has used in other movies. Like, I think especially Paprika. I mean, guys, what do you really think about that particular theme? <laughs> it, it's mind baffling right it, but it's very baffling it, it, it's baffling that that is actually a thing in real life is there scientific evidence to support that there there is evidence to support that shared delusions or shared psychosis I would actually like to happen, see. And, and it could actually happen at a social level as well Dang, i would like to see like published studies on that you know just because that's really interesting to me well yeah there, there's been mass hysterias that have occurred like for no reason like oh that's true back in the middle ages there were i don't even think it was the middle ages it may have been even like in the last century or so there was a huge dance hysteria where people would just start dancing in mass numbers like not even with music going and they would dance themselves to death that that's kind of the next level of a shared psychosis is mass hysteria yeah that makes sense and one more theme before we wrap things up that this movie really gets into that is kind of relevant to us as content creators and as personalities in public and everything is the concept of the parasocial relationship. The relationship between the audience and the entertainer or the creator that whose content they are consuming. And, and this is something I think uh, Aaron from Renegade Cut went into a little bit was, you know, how th this kind of leads to people online, you know, being a lot more personal with you than you're comfortable with because they think that you're pretty much like a friend of theirs. But, you know, you you never meet any of these people that that that's kind of a parasocial relationship in a nutshell. Catfish. Catfishing is kind of Catfish. a yeah, that's kind of an offshoot of it. But I actually find that theme to be very fascinating, like especially looking at how we deal with celebrities, how we deal with personalities on YouTube, how we deal with personalities in the podcast world. I mean, in many ways, I mean, we even do this with politics. We, we f feel this very, very close connection to 
the people at the top. And, and, and that's very much what's happening. Like in many ways, what's happening with Donald Trump and his followers is kind of a weird parasocial relationship <laughs> that's turned into mass hysteria and psychosis. That's pretty much that's pretty much that in a real life example in a nutshell. No, you're not wrong. That's <laughs> Yeah. It honestly after having watched the film, like I'm questioning notions of reality. <laughs> and, and also in a way you're also questioning some of the ways that you approach the things that you consume, right? Yeah, I mean this movie is like an acid trip. <laughs> yeah but it's the kind of acid trip that isn't you know it's not bad it's not gonna fuck you up it's just gonna be very revelatory and afterwards you might have a little better understanding of things that's the only kind of acid trip i have bo oh come on what the <laughs> fuck ever oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah whatever dude excuse me Mima was a pop star. This is Mima's last performance with Cham. Who desired to become an actress. I really hope that I can entertain you just the same as an actress. But sometimes, aspirations can be deadly. I'm always watching Mima's room! In the world of make-believe. This is when Mima proves herself. The price of fame. Don't worry, Mima, it'll be all right. May not be worth the cost of identity. <laughs> Where did this come from? How do they know so much? Innocence is lost. <gasps> Dreams become nightmares. And privacy no longer exists. Where everything you do can be seen by everyone. And those you trust are really those you should fear. Your life no longer belongs to you. Excuse me. Manga Entertainment presents Satoshi Khan's animated psychological thriller. Perfect. Excuse me, who are you? Excuse me, who are you? But anyway, I think that we're going to go ahead and start wrapping things up here. Uh, let's go ahead and give our final thoughts thoughts we'll go ahead and start with you ash well be coming from the background of being an otaku and in, in the american sense of fan of anime culture and of, of japanese culture in general this movie was interesting to me coming into that and seeing what i think is a more deeper and more meaningful exploration um or or example of that but embodies the, the qualities of it nonetheless so i think that perfect blue uh, is interesting not just from an anime film perspective, but just a genuine film perspective, um, which I, I think is why it was important to talk about that and, you know, the movie that we're going to be talking about next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead and give it a rating, Ash. How would you rate this movie? Ooh, um, I feel like I need another rewatch just to be sure. But, I mean, for me, I, I mean, it, it's perfect in its execution, but... I, I guess just me not fully understanding it and having a little bit of, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and go to a 4.5 out of five. I gotcha. I gotcha. That, that, that's reasonable. I feel like this could become a five out of five on another rewatch when I fully, you know, actualize everything that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, Robert, give us your final thoughts on this. I know you didn't talk a whole lot during no, this didn't. episode. I mean, you're, you're not really one of the anime fans here. Not so. really. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it twice. I mean, watched it with you and Ash. Yeah. And, you know, still trying to understand the whole thing. But what what, what do you think about the themes that we discussed? A young star just trying to figure out who she is before uh, all her innocence just go out the toilet, you know, really? Yeah, that's right. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting how you see that happen in real life, right? Yeah, like you, with, see, you see that with stars every day, right? Like, look at McCulkin, right? <laughs> yeah, McCulkin, Macaulay Culkin. McCulkin. Yeah, yeah, he kind of went through that a little bit. Even Canadian pop stars, man, they're like one-hit wonders, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're built up into a certain type of image, and then they're just kind of cast away. Exactly. After, after so, one song. As soon as they get older, or as soon as one album just 
Yeah, one hit wonder, exactly. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Exactly. Bieber managed to keep it up. It's cause was it? It's because it was Bang. Bieber. Oh, Bieber. Oh, God. Bieber was like the yeah. ultimate Canadian pop icon, and he's still relevant somehow. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and he's been around how long? Like almost close to 20 years now, right? Yeah. What's funny For is while. Ryan Gosling was built up that way, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And he, he's he from, was like. He Canada, was, too. He was from Canada. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, Robert, how would you rate this movie? Just based on what you experienced and how uh, you feel about it. I'll give it a four. I'll give it a four. Right on. Four out of five. Because right I, I still don't know what the hell. I, I probably need <laughs> I was, to watch it I one was, more time. I was almost expecting you to give it like a three or a 3.5. 3.5. Like, I'll just give it a four. That sounds just about a right. Four. Right on. Right on. Yeah. And I'm just going to go ahead and just, I don't know, maybe I'm biased. Maybe I shouldn't give it a rating. <laughs> I don't go know. Go for it. Honest opinion. I, yeah, five out of five for me. I mean, this is something that you y'all really need to understand about this movie is that this was Satoshi Kon's full-on cinematic debut. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie, but I feel like I just need, you know, for this to be a perfect five out of five, I just need more context yeah because yeah. I, I think having you know just being able to watch it again and, and also maybe exploring more of satoshi Kon's films yeah well, well that's not going to be hard because this movie is pretty much all context like there, there's okay. not any type of subtext to it at all it it really lays bare everything that it's trying to say that's about true. idol culture and otaku culture and the effects that it has on the people involved yeah, no, it, it's powerful in that sense. I think it's kind of like uh, Joker in that sense. It, it it has a parallel to that, you know, yeah. and also the way that it was used to influence Black Swan is really cool to me. But th this is a movie that I've loved pretty much from the very first moment that I saw it. I, th this is the original copy of the movie that I bought many years ago, and I'm amazed how it holds up from an animation point of view. Like, I, I love the story. The, the characters are so engaging, especially the main three. I mean, Mima is someone you really begin to care about, and, you know, your heart breaks for her in many, many places. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I really feel that Cone completely executed everything he wanted to do with this movie practically flawlessly. So Yeah, like I said, it's perfect in execution. If you know, Any detracting points for me are not out of this film's, you know, and its ability to accomplish its purpose. It's just, just personal bias thrown in there a little bit. And, and yeah. for me, I just need, I just need more time to understand this film. <laughs> Cause I, I really do feel like it would be a five out of five, but I need to love it. I got you. I, I got you right on. And right now I really, really, really like it, but I haven't, I haven't quite committed. I haven't put a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, Ash, what's going on with Collateral Gaming? Try to be a little quick. Yeah, for sure. Well, we just released our episode on Tomb Raider 2013. I uh, had a lot of fun with that. It was really uh, awesome to talk about that film, or <laughs> talk about that game. <laughs> and um, yeah, you should check that out. The other... Uh, game that we're going to be doing upcoming next month is going to be Spyro Reignited Trilogy. I'm really looking forward to being able to to throw myself in, into that world and to talk about it. Also, stay tuned because we're um, having a collab with Victims and Villains. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we're going to be working in, in, on, on the Victims and Villains podcast talking about Majora's Mask, which is one of my personal favorite video games of all time. So Awesome. Awesome. And as for Collateral Cinema and Collateral Cinema Director's Cut, uh, for the former, we're going to continue our two-part anime spectacular here with Akira. Oh, I'm really excited about that because yeah. I love Akira. And, and if I remember correctly, I think my brother wanted to be on this episode, so I'm going to contact him and I'm going to see if I can get that set up and see if he can Skype in or whatever. And that's another movie from back in the golden age of anime that I really, really love and I have a lot of affection for. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And for Collateral Cinema Director's Cut, which is Robert and I, that's our side podcast. We're going to be going into part two of our Friday the 13th franchise deep dive. 
We already went through the first five movies, and now we're going to finish it up with the last five movies. Right, Robert? Oh, yeah. So stay tuned. Yeah. We've been having a lot of fun with that, right? Download the first part if you haven't already. Yeah, definitely. I mean, listen to it. It's a lot of fun. We love the Friday the 13th franchise. Next to Halloween, it's practically like our, our official franchise. Yeah, that's the one we can just keep going back and putting yeah, on over and over. It's one of our all-time favorites. And yeah, stay tuned for that. You can find Collateral Cinema on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Chill Lover Radio, and iHeart Radio, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And also, look for us on Patreon and become a patron. Our tiers start at $1. We have feature full-length commentaries there. And also, find us on Podchaser. Give us a five-star review there. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That will help us move up the ranks. And anything else you guys want to say here? Oh, guys, stay safe and be uh, be kind to one another. Yeah, definitely. Robert, anything else? Stay social distance. Yeah, keep the social dis- distancing. Keep it up. And for me, justice for George Floyd. Yeah, I wanted to say, like, if you feel like your appearance ca- can cause you to be objectified by society in a way that's dangerous, I mean, I, I honestly feel for you. I mean, we want justice for that for you. Definitely. Definitely. So we're wrapping things up right now. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Robert Oregon. And this was Collateral Cinema. We are out. Out. Laters, everybody. Lateral Cinema is an L Company production. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.